So uh, just to kind of introduce everyone so far. Thank you. Um, we have a RP. What? Oh, she's in class. Okay, so RP and Hannah are presidents. They're not here, unfortunately. We have uh, Jackie. She's right there. She's our secretary. Sarah, who's up front, who's our treasurer. Hi, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Karen, he's our favorite advertising right here. You already want to see it. Alina, who's not here at the moment. Um, two membership officers, Misha and Jasmine, both are also busy. And then Evelyn, who's the chair of public relations. And then we have our Asha Rip, who's also in class as well. That's uh, yeah. Um, but anyways, welcome to Crash Course. This is kind of just to explain everything to you. So the next slide is, what is a speech language pathologist? So if you're kind of wondering, um, aside from speech and language, um, we also cover the domains of cognition, accent modification, voice, which is like vocal quality. Um, assistive um, augmentative communication. Um, what am I missing? Oh, how could I forget? <laughs> Swallowing and feeding. Um, and did I mention the accent modification? <laughs> and then we have we have a social and pragmatics and our sister field is audiology. So we work a lot with the deaf and hard hearing population. So this kind of, this slide kind of just outlines the different settings that you could possibly be looking in after you finish grad school and kind of jumpstart your career. You can work in the schools. A lot of people go that route. It's really great. And if you kind of put it down on paper, school SLPs make more money than anybody else in our field in any different setting. And that kind of just pans out with the amount of time that you work and the amount of time that you get off and the types of benefits that you receive. Um, you can also work at a skilled nursing facility. This um, setting pays out the most to clinicians. However, they will work you to the bone. Um, employee turnover rate is high. Um, and if, if you're a naturally overly empathetic person, probably won't stay at the setting for long. Um, then you have private practice, which is great if you're more of an independent person and you like to do things on your own terms. And if you're um, one of those people who's just like a go-getter, because this kind of requires you to be very autonomous. And if you don't like working for other people, or if you don't like working with constraints of bureaucracy, this might be the lane that you want to <laughs> you know you want to walk in. Hospitals, I mean, we all have seen Grey's Anatomy or kind of romanticize. <laughs> we romanticize that part, but I mean a hospital setting, like it's great to work in. You'll have a lot of resources. However, a lot of people get burned out in this lane too, just because there's like high productivity standards and um, it always just comes down to money. And sometimes you're the most expensive therapy service that we provide or that the hospital provides. So sometimes you're, it's just a lot of advocating for yourself. However, they love you and they will do anything to keep you. So whether that is you're working full time or you're working for DM, it's definitely a cool place to work in, especially if you're interested in pushing the boundaries of our field and doing research. Um, the acute setting is just another kind of facet of a hospital, which, and that just kind of basically means like acute is like, you've just left the ICU and your wounds are still fresh and you're kind of still um, getting into, you're in that golden window opportunity of therapy and rehab where you can make the most difference for someone. Um, a NICU um, is prenatal care. Unfortunately, on the West Coast, uh, our 
domain has kind of had to fight for their area or shared space with OTs because mainly in the NICU, you're not really working on speech and language, you're working on feeding and swallowing. And in terms of who got there first, in the West Coast, OTs did. And if you're interested though, I would suggest looking into working at a children's hospital or moving back east because SLPs kind of dominate the field when it comes to the NICU. All right, so what is a SLIPA? So basically, if you are interested in becoming or working within this field, however, you're broke, which a lot of us are. <laughs> um, some of you might opt to be a SLIPA first after doing undergrad here, which is basically your speech language pathologist assistant. So basically what you would be doing is you would be doing treatment only and you would be following the orders of a speech language pathologist. No diagnosing, no report writing, no assessing, just treatment. So this is great because the average salary for a SLIPA coming right out is like $20 an hour with a high of 38 after a couple of years of experience, which is great. Um, and it's good because we do need a lot of slippers as well. You will never have, you will never not have a job, either one. Um, but anyways, um, this is probably something you might be considering if you need money and you want money before you get into grad school. Um, what was going to say about this? Oh yes, most slipper programs require that you find your own supervisor. So if you plan to go this route, I would definitely choose to um, have someone in mind or you have an idea of where you'd like to learn and do your hours. It's required that you do 100 clinical hours with a supervisor when doing a slip of program. Um, and then just one other thing I want to add. So if you're not, if you are, you know, you already are set on becoming um, a fully licensed SLP, it is also important to understand the role of a SLIPA. Um, if you are planning to be an SLP that works in the school, very likely you are going to have SLIPAs that you're going to that are going to work under you. Um, so it's important to understand that as as an SLP in a school, because the SLIPAs are doing the treatment, you're actually going to be doing almost exclusively assessments and IEP meetings, and your SLIPAs are going to be the ones actually delivering therapy. It of course will vary from site to site, but that's the reason that slippers were created in the first place is because there's just not enough SLPs to do all the therapy. Um, so if you are planning to be a licensed SLP in a school, just be aware that you might not be doing as much treatment as you would be doing a slipper. That's a great point to make, especially because if you do become a speech language pathologist and you don't understand this role, and you happen to let them do the assessments or the report writing or attend the IEP meetings, your license, your will, license be will be re revoked. Yeah, so it's really, <laughs> it's really important to understand um, the role of the SLIPA and also what their scope is and um, where that falls within our code of ethics, which is the perfect timing. I'm Jasmine, I'm one of the Southwall students at the Stony as well. Um, we're an audiologist, so many of us know somewhat of what happens. Is um, person specializes in hearing and balance disorders. Um, the professionals present identify diagnosis and balance and other auditory <coughs> problems. Um, for instance, tinnitus or tinnitus, which is ringing in the ear. Um, the entry level for an audiologist, you have to have a doctoral degree, and after 2008, ALSHA changed it from a master's to now a uh, doctoral degree. Uh, CSUN and other four CSUs now have AED programs that are just in workings. We're the second right now, Castle is first. Um, usually takes about three to four years, um, depending. Um, University of Pacific and Pacific University are the only program for three years. Other schools are four years. Your first three years are instruction, and your fourth year, you're in residency. I'd like to 
remote to the Gray's Anatomy for residency. We're getting paid in your full course of the patients. Yes, we can. Yeah. Scope of practice. Um, so, excuse me. Um, we, have, we, are, we are clinical audiologists. We work in a variety of settings. Um, you go, you can specialize in um, a certain area like pediatrics, um, vestibular audiologists, um, you can work in um, hospitals or private settings or school or university. Um, and it's infeasible. And we're one of the only AUDs in the US that has forensics audiology as a course. And a vestibular program. And a vestibular program, which is a big up for AUD programs to try to get students to see CSUN as one of the many hazard traits. So we did learn one of our um, instructors who was a chair and grad coordinator of many years and started to develop the audiology program um, is a forensic audiologist and he's one out of seven, which is a big um, good thing. We would be considered a state public health um, working in. Do you want to say what a forensic audiologist is? So someone who doesn't know a forensics audiologist is an individual who goes to be studying. So let's say you are an Uber driver and you're driving and you get hit in a car accident and you start getting tinnitus or vertigo and you want to win the case, you want to sue Uber for certain um, accommodations. So you get your lawyer and the lawyer talks to an audiologist and starts to give you tests to see if you have vertigo. So you do a strict test. Uh, you can't test tinnitus, but start asking a questionnaire to rate and kind of get perspective of what if someone truly has tinnitus, because you could say you have PTSD rather than tinnitus. Um, we have educational audiologists, someone in the school setting who not only works with the pediatric audiologist, but works with the ENT, works with the we learned a auditory, auditory verbal therapist, an SLP. It's a big teamwork. Um, we have two vestibular audiologists um, as faculty who specialize in vestibular and tinnitus and CAP, which is central auditory processing disorder. Mm -hmm. And um, we have the researchers, and we just hired three new faculty at VSUN two who specialize in pediatrics and one who is a general clinician. Cool. Okay. So the next thing I wanted to talk about. Um, is just the different organizations. So we have a lot of uh, organizations within our field, so it can get a little bit confusing. Um, so the first one I'm gonna talk about is ASHA. This is the American Speech, Language, and Hearing Association. So this is at the national level. So everyone in the United States um, is at, who is a speech therapist or an audiologist, ASHA would be their national organization. Um, so they're the ones that give us the credentials. So if you see speech therapists with the SLP CCC, those CCCs are given out by ASHA, the clinical competence. Um, ASHA, it says here their mission is empowering and supporting speech language pathologists and, and hearing sciences. So um, it's just a way to kind of bring everybody together um, and have everybody be on the same page. One really important thing that ASHA does is they're the one that has our code of ethics. So the code of ethics is different than laws. They're not laws because you're not um, you're not breaking like a federal or state law. But if you break something in the code of ethics, you can have your license revoked. So it's really important to understand the code of ethics so that the, that those can be found on the actual website. Um, it's just a really good thing to explore because you don't want to lose your license after you work so hard for it. What is NISLA? So NISLA is the National Organization for Students. So just like ASHA is the National Organization for Speech Therapists and Audiologists, um, NISLA is ASHA's student organization. Um, and so it can be a little bit confusing because there's us, like we have our NISLA, but we're CSUN NISLA, and then there's also National NISLA. So there are two different things. A lot of people don't fully understand that. Um, does everybody here get that? Okay, cool. Well, I'm gonna do it pretty quick though, but for the Zoom people who don't, maybe don't know. Um, so National NISLA is, um, again, it's across all states. And then there's every single chapter or every single school that has a CDS program 
um, may or may not have a chapter NISLA. And so you can be a, a member of national NISLA and you can be also a member of CSUN NISLA or your chapter NISLA, or you can be both or you can just be one or the other. And there's different benefits to each. Um, so some of the benefits to being a national member um, is you have access to the actual leader, which I think I brought mine to you, but Okay. So these are the ASHA leader magazines. So when you're a member of ASHA, I actually reach out if anyone wants to look at them, just decide if you want to become a member. Um, this is a really good place to get information about what's going on in our field. They'll post different things, like if there's going to be changes in insurance policies, or if there's going to be different ways to um, be billing people, anything like that. ASHA will post an article about it, or if there's new research, maybe a new treatment method that is going to is now backed by evidence, they'll make an article about that. And just kind of like hot topics in the field, things that are being debated, things that, um, you know, some people believe this thing and other people believe this thing. And it's really important as a speech therapist and as a student to understand what's, um, what's happening out there in the field and what people are agreeing on or disagreeing on so that you can make an informed decision about how you want to go about therapy. Um, and then besides that, you also have access to ASHA journals. So this is really important as a grad student. Uh, you want to have access to all of those journals for all of those research papers that you have to write. All of, every, every time you have to write a research paper, you have to find journals. Um, and so having access to all of that is really helpful. Um, you also have access to the Action Center. So this is something that not a lot of people take advantage of, but if you go on the website, there's a phone number, there's an email, and there's even a live chat. You can ask them anything about, um, about becoming a speech therapist, if you have questions about the different requirements, like how many hours do I need? Um, can I do my clinical fellowship? Like in this sort of setting, any sort of questions you have, you have people that you can talk directly to and they can answer all those questions for you right away. Um, you also can get discounts, which is really great. Discounts to the ASHA convention. Uh, so that is going to be a collection of all of the speech therapists and audiologists that are ASHA members come all together for these big conferences. And there's, you know, there's presentations and there's workshops, and it's a huge networking opportunity. So especially either one as a student, if you're getting ready to apply to grad school, or if you're getting ready to graduate, those are there's especially crucial times to go to these events um, because you can be potentially meeting people that might want to hire you either as a, a CFY or as an externship, um, things like that. And they can be expensive, but if you're a NISLA member, it's significantly discounted. And the other big one that I have here in red, um, if nothing else, if you just, become a NISLA member and you don't use any of these other benefits, it's, you're gonna wanna do this because when you go to apply for your license, um, you're gonna have to pay, or when you go and you, you get licensed and you wanna become a, a full ASHA member, um, if you're gonna get $225 off your initial dues if you were a NISLA member for the last two years of your master's. So that's only $120 and then you're getting $225 off. So you're getting, you know, about a hundred bucks for free. So I think it's worth it. Can I mention something? Sorry. Um, what was kind of also mentioned up there is like an availability for a SIG member membership if you have the national NISLA membership. And also if you are a member of ASHA, you automatically have access to any of those SIGs. SIG stands for special interest group. So looking a little bit more short term to those of you who are applying to grad school or are trying to figure out what kind of therapist that you'd like to be, looking at those SIGs kind of gives you a kind of a little bit of a window of like where those special interests lie. So a great example is swallowing. There's a special interest group for swallowing. It's I believe SIG 13. And basically swallowing is just one of those areas where there's so many things that are debated all the time because you could potentially hurt someone and it's life threatening. But it's also the most challenging and usually people who 
specialize in swallowing. They have a huge passion for it and they pretty much follow it for the rest of their lives for the most part. Um, it's just really great because then you can read all of these articles, you can attend like local meetings or conventions for these special interest groups. And it gives you something to really think about, write about, kind of point you into a direction of where you'd like to go or what you think you want to be doing. So it's just, it's a, it's a really great resource that I don't think a lot of people at this point really take advantage of. Yeah, that's a really great point. So if it's something, if you have an area that you're interested a little bit and you want to learn more, um, and you might not be able to rely on just your classes for that, or especially if you're an undergrad, it's like you're, I mean, you're going to have to wait till potentially your second year to, to even get into a swallowing class. So if you're already interested in something like that, something more specific, um, or if you're, you know, really interested in working with pediatrics, or you're really interested in AEC, some of these more really subspecialty areas, this is a really great way to get more information. Um, I'm going to add on to that. There's, there's an app that you can download, uh, the ASHA community app. And this is actually somewhere, it's kind of like a social media app for ASHA. And this is where a lot of people will post about these special interest groups. And it's SLPs posting questions to other SLPs. So you as a student aren't able to post anything, but you can actually watch threads of SLPs debating different things. So an SLP will post something and say, hey, I have this type of client and I don't know, should I be using thin liquids or thickened liquids? You know, the research says 10 different things what's everybody else doing and then people can reply to that and so it's a really good app to just you know instead of browsing on facebook or instagram just kind of read through things and see what slps are talking about out in the field so you're cognizant of the types of issues that are, that are present. I'll also kind of jump on that too like um you'll see these threads and if you actually start doing some research in your undergrad classes you'll start to notice some names of people who published those people usually are in those conversations so you get to see right from the source what's happening now and how their opinions may have stayed the same or changed um i'm going to jump ahead real quick because our audiologists want to talk about their organization sorry we yeah. jumped out of class to yeah. just don't do it please don't do it <laughs> um so yes we have AAA, so just like a national, just like Nishla has ASHA, which is both audiologists and SLP. In the late 80s, um, it changed to audiologists, one of their own group, and so they have AAA, uh, which is the Academy of Audiology, um, American Academy of Audiology, which is a national organization as well. And then um, the Student Academy of Audiology is our student association, and CSUN is a chapter of the um, we just got completed. And then the next slide we'll have our first event, which is February 5th. So please spread the word and you can go on Zoom or anyone who's curious to know about audi audiology. What is it? Um, what do you do in your program? Ask us grad students to, and we've got pro students who have um, shadowed or are in the program right now, taking 15 units and work equal time and have our own busy schedule. We want to know how do you juggle it? And um, it might just come in use um, for you later. If you have decided SLP, um, you do eventually have to take a pediatric audiology class, so this might be difficult for you to send your phone. So please spread the word and um, look forward to us. We are CSUN uh, SAA on social media as well. Okay, cool. So do you have anything else out about being that successful? Just do it. <laughs> Let's do it. It's worth it. That's the point. So sorry. Real quick, we have more undergrad. We have two undergraduate representatives. One of them's here, Jackie. She stepped out. If you have any questions on audiology, you should refer to her. If she doesn't have questions, she'll do, she doesn't answer it. She'll give us your email. Okay. So you'll be seeing her from now on going to classes, make a presentation for us. Okay. Cool. Um. Yeah. Cool. 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 <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Now, what about CSUN NISLA? Obviously, you want to be a CSUN NISLA member. It's only $20. It's totally worth it. Um, for one, you get into events for free. So after this event, every event's going to be $5. Um, so it pretty quickly becomes worth it. Um, it's also a great thing to put on your resume. A lot of 
grad schools and also out there working. People want to see that you were involved. People want to see that you were a part of your student organizations because that shows teamwork, it shows leadership. Um, and so being able to throw on their CSUN Nisla member since 2020, that's going to look good. Um, you also get access to the Zoom recording. So everybody can have access to the live recording right now. Um, but say you weren't, you know, you have work at this time, so you're not able to log on, then um, you can have access to the Zoom recording that we sent to you. You can watch it after the fact. Um, also, a big benefit of being a CSUN NISL member is you have access to one to one tutors. So, we have our study hall that's going to be every Wednesday from two to four. Two to four. It's going to be every Wednesday from two to four. Um, but if you're feeling like you really need uh, some more one-to-one -one help, then if you're a CSA NISLA member, you have free access to um, schedule an appointment time with one of our tutors um, and meet with them one-on-one. -on -one. So that's pretty invaluable. Um, the other big thing is the NISLA recognition course. So if you want to graduate and you want to have the NISLA course um, to represent, you know, that you're an active student, um, you can't just buy them, you have to become eligible for them. And so to become eligible, you have to earn points. And so you'll hear us talk about points a lot. Um, you guys, all of your members, you're gonna get your points for today. Um, and if you wear your merch, then you get extra points. And once you rack up 100 points um, for a semester, is it for three plus two zero? Or is it for a semester? I think it's just in general. Just, just in, in general. general. Yeah. Okay, uh, 100 points. Then you can um, then you can purchase those recognition points. So that's a that's a huge benefit of being a CSUN NISLA member. Um, um, just to go along with like we as a board this past academic year have kind of revamped a lot of things. The events being one of them. Um, if you feel like you need more or you want to be enriched more, everything that we do is in service to you guys. So last year we had some really great events. One of them, which I feel like has been talked about a lot, which was Grand Browns. And like, in order to exit from this program, you are, been, you are given two case studies. You, are, uh, you have 30 minutes to come up with your plan He's talking about comps. I'm talking about a comprehensive exam. Yeah. yeah. For the comprehensive exam. You're given two case study scenarios. You're given 30 minutes to come up with a plan of how you would treat that client. And then you were presented in front of a panel of three of your professors and you have to defend every decision that you make. That sounds scary now, but that event is basically supposed to help you come up with your critical thinking and clinical reasoning skills. Because basically what we've done is we've reached out to professionals out in the field to come and present cases to you and they tell you what they did and why they did it. So it's supposed to help you. Um, and the speakers are very engaging. Most of them present on cases that are so interesting and sometimes very niche yes a great example is a pediatric vocal nodules case which is um you might all you're, be like you're what? not going to hear that in your class yeah <laughs> so uh it's just and we have a lot of, we have a lot of great new events planned for this year too one of them being a feeding and lactation panel so that's another niche area of speech language pathology. And I did kind of mention it before that you, we as SLPs, if you're interested in being in the NICU, having a presence in the NICU, um, this is real life uh, professionals who do this sort of stuff every day with a team of other um, allied health professionals. Uh, so yeah, um, if so, if you're debating, do I need to become a member of both NISLA and CISA NISLA, I would highly recommend doing both because they're completely different benefits. And again, it looks really good to anyone who's looking to hire you or grad applications that you're doing both. Um, so then we already talked about SAA. Yes, question. What are some methods of uh, applying for NISLA? 
So if you are interested in applying for NISLA, we have some membership applications here tonight. Um, if you're not here live tonight, then, um, or if you don't want to pay for it tonight, then you can also get membership applications down in the lobby um, on our board. There's always applications there. Or you can also email uh, the CSUN NISLA nisla.csun at gmail.com and request an application or DM Instagram and we can send you an application, which is CSUN NISLA, just at CSUN NISLA. Um, I just want to highlight this event again. Um, I know that most people are interested in speech therapy and not audiology. This is still a very valuable um, event for speech therapists because as, as speech therapists, we're going into the same field. We're going to be working on multidisciplinary teams with audiologists. We're going to be working with children who are deaf and hard of hearing. And so it's really important that we don't have this huge differentiation between like speech therapists and audiologists. We really need to create more of a team environment. And so it's really beneficial to us to have a better understanding of the field of audiology as a whole. So that makes us more valuable team members um, in any setting. So then CASHA, so we have another organization. So CASHA is the California Speech and Hearing Association. So this is specific to our state. So every state, um, as far as I know, has their own organization um, like, like CASHA. Um, we're very fortunate in California because our state organization, CASHA, is a, pretty... it's a very well-renowned one. It's very well established. Um, you know, when you go to ASHA, they're very active compared to some of the other states. Um, it's a really great organization to be a part of. So great, in fact, that I've created a poster to convince you with testimonials from real grad students and undergraduates here at CSUN um, who are all CASHA members and have found benefit um, from being a member of CASHA. Um, the reality is, is that whoever will hire you or whoever you'll work with to are CASHA members. Yes. And will probably be at CASHA trying to recruit you, network with you, whatever. It is another great networking opportunity. It's also another great learning opportunity. I can, I myself can tell you that I landed my externship through CASHA. Yes. So, and that's at a children's hospital down in San Diego. Yes, the networking that you do at CASHA is invaluable. The connections that you make through these organizations is invaluable. There are so many applications out there. Everybody wants to get in a medical setting. Everybody wants, you know, thinks that their application and resume is the best. But at the end of the day, what it takes is somebody saying, oh, I met him at CASHA. He came up to me. He really had the right attitude. I was really impressed with da 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 da. And the other thing too is with Casha, there's it's a whole week uh, or it's a whole weekend um, of the convention, and there's many many opportunities in the convention to get involved. And so the more active you are within your own district, so um, I should explain California is uh, separated into districts. And so you can look up on the CASHA website and find out what district you live in. If you live around this area near Northridge, then you're in District 7. Um, and so there's going to be district meetings where you can go um, throughout the year to go meet with speech therapists that are within this area. Um, but it's, there's so many opportunities to get involved. That one looks really great on your resume, so it shows initiative, it shows leadership, um, and two, it just gets you connected with other people, and it gets you opportunities to be exposed to different things. Like if you are again are interested in certain areas, then you meet speech therapists, and they say, "Oh, I work in this specialty area." You can ask them to go observe and go find out if you actually want to do these things. Um, also, she's being a little bit modest, but she's kind of the team who won the Knowledge Bowl last year. <laughs> yeah. So that's so. For example, one of the cool things that you can do as a cash member is um, we decided last year for our first time that we were going to compete in the Knowledge Bowl, which is a student trivia game that takes place at ASHA. So we competed. Um, it was a panel of four of us, and we competed against maybe ten other schools in California. Um, and we won, and we won the Knowledge Bowl. And because we won the Knowledge Bowl, I don't have to pay for my practice. 
I got a free praxis. It's pretty awesome. And from that, guess what? People know what that is. People hear about it. People see that. And so people know that, and I can put on my resume, Knowledge Bowl winner 2019, you know, and possibly for, for sure 2020. <laughs> <laughs> Spell it out there. <laughs> Future winner of the 2020 Knowledge Bowl. Um, and because I showed that initiative and got us into the to the Knowledge Bowl, um, people within Kasha uh, know me and recognize me. And so um, I applied and I also got a, um, a position on the National MISPA board. So I'm a student state officer. And so because I did that, people start to recognize and know my name and say, wow, this person really has some leadership skills. So for this Kasha, um, I, now I'm going to grab. <laughs> so for this, um, for this Kasha, I was actually nominated and won the Kasha Outstanding Student Award for our district, which sounds like, oh my God, what a cute, you know, like, how could you do that? What a cute honor. But to be honest, there's not a lot of students co competing against me. <laughs> like, because it, it just takes that little bit of initiative. It just takes that showing up. It just takes going to the meetings and shaking hands and saying, hi, I'm a student, I'm at CSUN. And all of a sudden it's like, it's not that big of a network of speech therapists out there. And so you do a couple of things and people start to recognize you and they want to encourage that. And so people are going to come to your aid and people are going to support you. And so I'm extremely supported in Kasha because I've made these little initiatives. I moved from Northern California and had no network. I knew absolutely nobody. I had nobody in this field. And within the last three years, I'm like, I know so many speech therapists all over California, some who I've met, some who I haven't met, and I'm just connected to emails and LinkedIn and stuff. But it's all because of Kasha. And it just blows my mind that people are not moving to Kasha. It is like the simplest thing that you can do to boost your resume, to boost your career, to boost your experience as a speech therapist or an audiologist in general because it is a built-in support system for you. They've all been through it, they all know what you're going through, and we're all like loving, caring, empathetic people, and so you can be surrounded by that. Thank you, Judy. Except Donald can sit down. <laughs> okay, so this is super out of order. <laughs> <laughs> chair of, of public relations, so I am the person who is in charge of the point system for CISA NISLA. So why do points matter? Uh, the, the points, as uh, Karen explained, is how you are able to earn the opportunity to buy the regalia that you can wear during your graduation. Um, so we have a bunch of different ways that you can receive points. Uh, I'll go to the bottom up. Uh, first, our newsletter activities. As a CISA NISLA member, you get access to our monthly newsletter. So in the past, it has just kind of simply been just like the posters of our upcoming events that month and uh, the crossword puzzles. But now it's been revamped. We have extra sections that have like student essays or uh, and ask an SLP or ask a grad student or uh, a doctoral student, anything like that. And that's uh, an additional way to earn points. If your essay gets posted, if your uh, question is posted, those are ways for you to get points as well that have been added. But the newsletter activities have always been there. It's usually around like a word search or a crossword puzzle or a word scramble, something fun that incorporates the vocabulary of the uh, communicative disorders field. So that's an easy five points. It takes maybe 10 minutes, and sometimes there's two. So it's an easy 10 points that you can get in just a little bit of effort. Um, wearing your CSUN is a t shirt to an event. So we have t shirts here, and we also have hats and jackets. So all of those things are available for you to wear to events, and that's an easy way to just up the amount of points. If you're already going to an event, it's such an easy way to just get additional points. Um, and then of course the events, they're always around 10 points. Um, sometimes like say you go to the Kasha convention, those 
or the ASHA convention, we offer more points for those kinds of things because you have to take into account that you bought a ticket, you traveled, and you made that extra effort. So those are also ways to get extra points. Um, I'll go to the next uh, page to talk about uh, the tutoring. So uh, CDS peer tutoring, uh, we discussed, is going to be happening on Wednesdays from 2 to 4. Uh, if you want to be a peer tutor, this is completely run by successful CDS students. So if you got through your four core classes with at least an A minus, you may qualify to be a peer tutor. Now for every, um, for every peer tutoring that you attend, you get, I believe it's two points, and then you get an extra 20 points at the end of the semester if you have uh, come to at least four out of the five required uh, peer tutoring sessions that comes from you. So, you know, phonetics, hearing science, uh, speech language development, and speech science, those are the four classes if you've got really good grades in that. Um, yeah, just feel free to send an application. And you can do it. Additionally, it will also be overseen by a graduate student. So um, when the time comes for you to apply to grad school and you're needing that help with your statement of intent or your CD resume, that grad student will be there to help you. So right. is this me? I, don't. I believe it's me. Okay, so uh, permission numbers. So unlike the rest of the way that this university operates, our department does <laughs> not give out permission numbers unless it's like you've been approved and it's like two weeks before classes start or sometimes less. Yeah. <laughs> and it's only for grad students that get the permission numbers. For the rest, for you undergrads, it's mainly um, you've declared yourself as major and if there's space for you and if uh, Carla and Michelle are feeling very generous. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean it's just it's being recorded. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just very competitive. So with that in mind, like there's space and then there's no space. And unfortunately if you're on the waiting list and no one drops, then you're you're kind of out of luck. So then your best bet is to join during summer, which unfortunately is more expensive. Um, but you will definitely have much more of a chance of getting the classes that you need if they are offered in summer. Um, however, the good news is that once you pass the four four classes, did I say that correctly? Four. Yes. Four core classes, yeah. um, the rest of it should be relatively smooth sailing for you. Um, does anybody have specific questions about that process? Okay. Okay. So with that being said, be nice. And I, I, I say that specifically for our department, but Karen just got on a soapbox of how interconnected our world is and how small we are. We are a subset of a subset of a group of people. So the reality is, is that what you do here in school is probably gonna follow you to the rest of your career as well. So whether you were a nice person or if you were a mean one, um, if you stepped on somebody's back to get where you want to go eventually, that's probably gonna follow you. So be nice. And that means be nice to Carla, who is the department secretary at the front office here. Definitely be nice to Rochelle, who is basically the gatekeeper for Dr. Seymour, who's the head of our department. And also be nice to Dr. Seymour, who teaches a section of phonetics still, right? She does, <laughs> um, and she, she does know her stuff, so she will challenge you. Um, and also, eventually you're gonna need something from her to sign, for her to sign off on something for you. 
eventually your paperwork will come across her desk, so be nice to her. And finally, please be nice to Mrs. Wolsey, who runs the clinic downstairs. If you eventually do become a grad student, she is basically in charge of your first three clinical placements on campus. So if you're interested in seeing a specific population on campus, I wouldn't cross her either. Um, if any of these people know your name, it better be a very good name. Yes. Do not barge into their office demanding things, which has happened before. And usually those students have been blacklisted and don't get anything that they need. So just be nice. <laughs> yeah. And you can it can feel like you know you've been wronged, this is a mistake, you have to fix this. But the reality is you're one of so many students who the same exact thing has happened to. It's absolutely a fixable mistake. And if you just go and you talk to them patiently, they'll respect that and they'll fix your mistake. But if you come at them um, feeling with any air of entitlement that this needs to be fixed right this second because this is messing up my life, um, you're just going to fall to the bottom of the list and they're going to deal with the people that are being patient and coming in and saying, I know you have a lot to do, but can you please A, B, and C? With that being said, um, Anna and I work for the distance department. So we kind of have those same roles for any of you prospective students who are gonna apply to the distance program as well. If you're rude to us on the phone, we take note of that and we let Sherry and Rosie know who are basically the ones that ultimately decide who gets into the program and who doesn't. Um, so decorum on all fronts. <laughs> okay, um, and then just kind of an overview of Monterey Hall, our building in general. Um, so classroom Monterey Hall, uh, room 101 is the big classroom downstairs. Um, as undergrads, that's where you're gonna have most of your classes. These upstairs classes are for the grad, um, the grad program. Um, then downstairs, there's the two wings. Uh, if you're coming in the building from this parking lot, this parking lot, the left wing is going to be the early intervention clinic, which um, is a clinic that you can um, you, you can have your clinical experience there as one of your on campus clinics um, here at CSUN. And it's essentially a self running like preschool program, but it's for you know children birth to three that have some sort of developmental disability or delay. Um, and it's it's just it's really fun and really cute. And then the other side is the general clinic which is also really fun it's not quite as cute <laughs> and um there's that's the general clinic and also the specialty clinic so we have um general clinic just means like articulation language all of the general populations then the specialty clinics that we offer um here for your clinical experience we have a fluency clinic um we have an aac clinic we have a voice clinic we have um, a parkinson's voice clinic we have um, an aphasia group clinic. We have a social skills clinic. I think I got them all. Did you say for the okay. Yep, so those are our specialty clinics, and we have our general clinic. Um, then oh, this, feeding. And there's a feeding clinic. Sorry, <laughs> feeding. Uh, toddler feeding. So not adults, just toddler feeding. Um, then we have the picture here is the clinic office, which I'm sure you've all seen. So if you do graduate school here, you'll become very comfortable with this room because this is where you're going to see um, where you're going to pick up all your clients, where you're going to get your client files. Um, I work here in the clinic office, so if you have any questions about how the clinic runs, feel free to ask me after. I won't, I'm not going to get into too much detail about it. Um, we also have, this is where you're going to find the materials room. So what's great about our on-campus clinic is we have this giant room with a bunch of games and articulation cards and workbooks um, and all sorts of stuff that you have access to as a student clinician. Um, so you don't have to bring in all of your own materials. You can check stuff out um, and use the materials there in the clinic um, to see your clients. Um, so yeah, as an undergrad, your relationship with this clinic is going to be if you're doing the um, what is it like 469a diagnostics. yeah diagnostics 
then you might have you have an assignment where you have to review a certain test. So this is where we keep all of the assessments and they're ones that are actually given to clients um, in the clinic. Your relationship to this room is also, it is directly next to the lobby. And it's a big two open doors and we can hear you and sound travels. And so that idea of decorum um, and being professional, every time you step into this building, you are a professional. Every single time you step into this building, you should be using professional language. You should not be talking about like what you did this weekend, how you got to the wild. Like, be careful what you're saying here, because again, like for one, clinic coordinators are in there. Uh, you know, Jana Schoolsy's in there. Some of the other staff can be in there. You don't want to be flagged as you know being inappropriate or unprofessional while you're in this building. And secondly, this is also where we see clients. Like there's real families and real children here. Um, and it just is a really bad reflection on us if students are standing in the hallway um, and just talking inappropriately, which we're saying this because it does happen. Um, and, oh, I'm you not, believe. and I'm not kidding you, the sound travels like crazy. Like I'm sitting all the way in the back of the office. And I'm like, ooh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so keep that in. Okay, so here's the. So the second floor, okay. So then on the second floor, that's where one of our specialty clinics, the voice clinic is upstairs. Um, and that is because as the voice clinic, they have a lot of um, equipment that they use. So that's why they're not in the general clinic. They have a lot of different, um, just very high tech fancy equipment that they use. Um, and then there's also the audiology clinic. So if you guys are interested in the odd program, that is where all of the audiologists are. We also do see clients for audiology. So we do, you know, full comprehensive assessments. Um, we dispense hearing aids. We're a full functioning audiology clinic. Um, and so all of those clients are seen on the second floor. Um, there's also the hallway with the distance learning faculty, which is where Sean and Anna are. Um, and we also have an autism clinic here um, in the building, which isn't related to our major, it's not something that you will ever take part in as a CDS student, um, but it is just important to be aware because if you see families or if you see children, um, and you're just wondering why, what's going on, or you know, if you're hanging out on the second floor for some reason and some kid comes busting into the room and throws himself on the floor and starts having a tantrum. Which they do. Don't be too alarmed because it's just, you know, there's the autism thing here and sometimes little ones that you also might see those students and those students might actually help you if you become a grad student and if you have a non-compliant child in a clinic they might show up there and be your behavior therapist for the day um and then the third floor here we are on the third floor in room 341. So this room and a couple of other rooms around here, this is um, where a lot of the graduate classrooms um, are because once you get to the graduate level, um, not as many students will be per class. So we get these smaller classrooms with comfortable chairs. Um, we also have Dr. Hall um, down this hallway. He is the, um, he's the person who does uh, coordinates for student teaching. So if you do get into grad school, um, that's just important to know that Dr. Hall is the one who you talk to about student teaching. So he's the one that you tell like, hey, I'd really love to work in this particular school district, or I know so-and-so who takes student teaching and I would really like to work under them as my mentor. Um, and then Dr. Yu is also down here as well. Um, who she teaches the swallowing course and motor speech disorders um, and she's just an all-around fantastic amazing professor. If you are interested in research, Dr. Yu is the person you want to talk to. Um, she is an incredible researcher. She has many, many years um, and is like a well-published professor um, and she's just really passionate about research and she's really passionate about getting students involved in research. In this past academic year alone, she's had seven or nine posters presented at this year's Ashton Convention yeah. for students, basically. 
she elevated them and pushed them to present at ASHA. Exactly. Mm -hmm. She's supporting students to get involved in research. So all you have to do for, for office is like tutors down on the right, walk in there and just say like, hey, I'm interested in research. And within a year, you could have a poster at ASHA. Mm -hmm. If you so choose. <laughs> Um, and then down the other way is uh, where I'm sure you guys are all familiar with Carla and Michelle's offices, um, Dr. Seymour and the faculty. Uh, and there are a few other classrooms um, back there. Um, okay, yes? Uh, it's a little unrelated, but is there like any form of counseling for uh, the CB major? You know, I know we had like advising to talk about like what classes will be and uh, what classes are, you know, preferable to take next. And I know that Dr. Hall also is willing to help out with class scheduling. But mm -hmm. we have like official counseling, like counseling, academic counseling, something like that, or like, like well, psychological like, counseling. Yeah, well, no, not <laughs> psychological, like more like academic. Um, yes, so that is a great question. Thank you for bringing that up because I know with undergrads you don't have a specific academic counselor. Yep. But as a graduate student, as soon as you get into the graduate program, you will be assigned an academic counselor. Um, and so it'll be based on your last name. So like you know, A to F is going to be assigned to um, one particular, and it's all going to be faculty within the building. So like Dr. Yu is an academic. Um, Dr. Kaka Jennings, who is a voice specialist, is one. Dr. Greg Russo's, um, Dr. Weber. Um, so yes, you do have a specific academic counselor that you will be assigned to, and you will meet with them at the beginning, and you'll go over your whole plan of what classes you're going to take and what semester you're going to take it. Um, and they're the person that you can email with any questions, like, "Hey, I want to take this week to teaching earlier. I want to make this change." Um, but having said that, all, most of the staff are academic counselors, so if we have a relationship with any of the staff, most of them are very open to talk informally about kind of your academic plan or something. If you feel like you need help from a student level, uh NISLA members like all of the grad students have gone most of them have gone through this the undergrad program so if you feel like you've asked all the help that you needed from a professor or you feel too intimidated to talk to a professor and you still need help i mean that's another this is a this is a yet another support system built for you which is another reason to become a member of this chapter. Um, however, like we said before, like the kind of classes that you get in undergrad, it's like you get what you get and you don't get upset kind of. Yeah. Uh, with that being said, also like, uh, they can work with your, work schedule to a degree. Like if you've requested something and they gave it to you, but then your work changed and then you need to change it again. Uh, that's uh, like school in this field kind of comes first. Cause like there's been a lot of that lately. <laughs> um, yeah, if you're, if you're gonna be working while well, you're, especially when you're in grad school, you have to work somewhere that understands that you're in grad school. And is flexible with your hours. If you work somewhere where nope, you have to be here Monday, Monday and Wednesday all day every day, that's not going to work because at some point you're going to have to take a class in the middle of the day. And stay. So if you're going to work in grad school, which is totally possible, we do it. I think every member on of, of the board has a part time or semi full time job or two jobs or three jobs. It's totally possible, but it has to be flexible. Which is great because some speech pathology programs do not allow you to have a job. Right. So that's that to consider too for grad school. With that being said, moving on to actual prerequisites. Um, 
in addition to the prerequisites that the university requires you to get a bachelor's degree, ASHA itself has imposed um, a certain number of prerequisites for you to take in order for you to be board certified by them. And basically it's these four classes. It needs to be a biological, a physical, a social behavioral science and a statistics class. Does anyone have any specific classes that they don't really know fit within these categories that they want to pose to me right now? Because I literally answer these questions almost every day. What's up? Um, what about maybe like electives? Well, because I know like, um, I think there are electives that kind of tie in with the major or kind of somewhat required. Can you give me a class number? Or? Is it APC mm -hmm. Maybe uh, one of those might count. I mean, not like APC and FCS, or FCS is not required anymore, but APC will be required from you regardless, uh, which is not listed here. Sorry, um, I guess that's new. That's new, but EPC 314 is required from you. You need to take that in order to be licensed on the state level in California if you want to be a speech language pathologist. EPC 314. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. It's official, guys. Um, <laughs> um, however, a biological science just means biology. Um, anatomy, physiology. That's all that that means. Physical science is chemistry and physics. Nothing else can apply to that. No geology, no earth science. Uh, social behavioral, I mean, that's kind of built into your general eds anyways. It's your psych, it's your anthro, it's your sociology. Statistics, it's gotta have statistics in the title. So it could be a statistics on art history. If it's got statistics in the title, then you're golden. If it is a statistics class, and for some reason there is no mention of statistics in the course or course description, then I would drop that class and get another one. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions about this? Okay. I have a question. Oh, Sorry. Um, are these courses like time sensitive, such as like, um, you can, like they're only good for a certain amount of years? Because I took most of these prereqs at the community college level. That's so, fine. That's okay. fine. There's no time sensitive. If you're, if you're still an undergrad and you're kind of prioritizing things, I would prioritize your CD classes first mm -hmm. and these second, because you can get these at any time and not even from CSUN, you could get them out of community college. Okay. Any more questions about communication disorders or why they happen? Do you have questions about any upcoming events or speech language pathology in general? Any salary questions yes, or whatever? Um, just to clarify, were the points 100 or 150? On the Great question. I also wanted to <laughs> <laughs> We don't have our point officers here. Yeah, it, it was 150, and it also used to have the span of you had to be active for three consecutive, or not consecutive, but three full semesters. Uh, we realized that um, that was a little bit ridiculous. So it has now been switched to as long as you reach the points, doesn't matter how long or how short it takes. Than you are, and it is now 100 points instead of 150. So that plus two makes it Any other questions? Oh, sign out um, before you go so we can uh, count you for your points. Yes. Another question? Yes. <laughs> before you uh, began your grant program, was there anything that they required of you in the summer, like when you got accepted? Yes. You're required to attend a boot camp 
So that's basically. Okay. Yeah, it's fine. Um, so you are required to attend a boot camp, um, and that's going to take place the week before classes start. So you still get like a full summer, but then the week before classes start, um, you come to boot camp, and it's it's three, it's like two and a half days, full days, and um, you're going to listen to a bunch of lectures. And it's essentially to kind of get everyone like back up to speed. And it's it's primarily for, because not everybody came to undergrad here. Um, so it's primarily to make sure that everybody's entering with the same base knowledge as far as um, phonetics and the IK symbols um, and what are language disorders. And also just kind of the expectations of working in the clinic. Um, your, um, what you have to do to be a clinician, a student clinician, um, and just things like that. Um, trying to think of like a PC way to say this. Um, it's mandatory. You have to be there. Probably the most benefit that you're going to get out of being there is meeting your fellow classmates and networking with um, the people that you're going to be working with and meeting the faculty and getting just assimilated to coming to this, um, coming to Monterey Hall, where are the classrooms. Um, as far as preparing you for what's about to happen. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, that, but that is why we created um, the grad, grad panel. panel. So that is, man the boot camp is mandatory, but you definitely also want to come to in the first week of um, fall semester, we have our grad panel where myself and whoever, well, I guess like whoever else is um, a RA graduate student will sit and, and we're literally a panel and you can ask us all of your burning questions like, am I going to die? Like, <laughs> what happens if I get sick and can't come to class? What, what do I do if... Real life scenarios in yeah. the clinic will be played out in front of you yes. so that you will understand how to deal with them as well. Yeah. Um, it's a it's a panel it's a panel specifically for run by people who have successfully completed all of their clinics and have found the easiest way for you guys to navigate from jumping in from just learning about theory to going straight to practice. And that involves um, applying those therapy techniques and report writing. Yes, but to bounce back to your question, because I've had other people ask me this before as well, um, like, oh, I got into grad school, should I be doing anything to prepare? Like, should I be studying? No, <laughs> savor your time. <laughs> do not do anything. Like. The moment you send off your applications and you finish school and you are done and you are just waiting to hear if you get into grad school, do absolutely anything Live else. your best Literally life. <laughs> anything else because soon you'll have no choice and you will be neck deep in everything CDS and it's going to be your career potentially for the rest of your life. So during that summer, do literally anything else that you enjoy. Any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? Questions about anything? Any Zoom questions, Jackie? Any questions about grad school? Okay, do then. Right, well, thank thank you, you all for coming. Um, our next event is actually happening next week, and it's called Drag Queen Bingo, and it's literally like what it sounds. It is bingo hosted by drag queens in West Hollywood. It's pretty awesome and to kind of spice things up if drag queens were not spicy it, enough. To, you, um, you are playing for prizes so there are like 10 gift baskets filled with various uh, awesome prizes that are included in those baskets um, all of which it cost any money to go? $20 um, if you want to play bingo. So $20, but the prizes range much higher than that. Yeah, there, and there's some really good uh, like gift cards. I think the grand prize is um, Magic Castle.
And the fundraising is basically, it goes back into all of these events and it also goes to our alumni association, which also hosts a couple of events from time to time for us. One of them being speed mentoring which is a great one if you do become a grad student because basically those are panels of speech language pathologists in three different settings, medical, private practice, and school. And basically they tell you anything and everything that you wanna learn about those specific settings and what they're expected from you when you become a speech language pathologist. Okie dokie. <laughs> Thank you. I know. Thank you. Yeah. Success. All right. 